Welcome to Political Adda. I am Mansi Farke, Deputy Editor with the Print. Uh, joining me from Delhi is our Political Editor D K Singh, and uh, we also have uh, Mr. Ajinkya Kaipar, who is a researcher at Mumbai's S I S College uh, with its Politics Department. Now, for the past few days, Maharashtra has been gripped by a fresh wave of uh, Maratha protests, uh, uh, with the community demanding uh, reservation in government jobs and education. And this time, it is not just politicians from the three ruling parties of Maharashtra uh, who are, uh, you know, facing the pressure, uh, which is uh, Ekna Chinde led Shiv Sena, BJP, and the uh, Ajit Pawar led NCP, but politicians from the opposition parties. Uh, are also facing the heat and this is what we are going to talk about in this episode of political adda uh, the fallout of the entire situation so to begin with you know the marathas uh, is one of the most dominant uh, communities within maharashtra they comprise 32% of the state's population they have also dominated the political class in maharashtra to a large extent 11 of maharashtra's 20 chief ministers have been from the maratha community So you know, uh, I want to bring Ajinkya in here. Who are the Marathas? Why is the community demanding reservations? It's a demand that dates back to the 1980s. But why? As we have rightly pointed out, that these are the 31 percent or 32. The uh, the nearest estimate is 32 to 33 percent of the state is dominated by Marathas. Uh, you're right when you say that they politically dominate the scenario. But over the years, what uh, has happened is. i see that there are two frames of thought that come here one is of course uh, a deritualization and a secularization of caste that has happened over a period of time and due to that a constitution has been able to grant certain opportunities to the lower caste or the backward caste and that has created certain anxieties among the dominant caste or the dominant populations land was something that was uh, that was a prized possession of the marathas and eventually you see that after abolition of zamindari or several land reforms that the government of india undertook in the 1950s and the 60s uh, the situation was kind of changing and eventually over a period of time land was something that could not be produced it was rather shrinking the population was increasing and eventually you could not fit into uh, uh, you know the erstwhile situation or position of economic dominance once upon the cooperatives were failing the patronage networks were failing and that's where parties like bjp capitalized on obc networks of forming obc uh, blocks in march particularly the strategy of the rss that was used to bring in banzaris and other castes or mm-hmm. agris together was something uh, that was denting so i look at this as uh, somewhere a crisis uh, which has these three angles which are political economic and also sociology I think let me address the elephant in the room here. You are looking at it from the Maratha perspective, but if you look at it holistically, how justified is the demand? Because if I recall it right, in the Supreme Court, when the Fadnavis government gave them a reservation, the Supreme Court struck it down, and the main basis was that the court was not convinced that they are socially and educationally backward. So, given that background. Might have resurfaced, but how justified is it? So I would not take away the right of demand from the community, but I'll also point out the fact that uh, if we have to really check the efficacy or the justification that comes from, it's rather very weak today. Uh, I would rather understand it as a very, uh, you know, it's a strong demand, but uh, on very flimsy or weak grounds. Probably because again the reasons are historical. Uh, that when marathas were being imagined as a community this was a forged identity that was created by mahatma jyotiba phule uh, where he wanted to talk about the non brahmins particular it's eventually when the movement after phule went on to have maratha patronage and that's where the kshatriya hood came in so you had an internal hierarchy then the census reports came in and then the idea of depressed classes were uh, debated or were talked about marathas were dealing from the non brahmin status quite early on and they did not mind this uh, eventually when you talk about the justification of the demand uh, i believe again uh, socially and social and educational backwardness is something that is a reality and we have to face that reality uh, as i just mentioned a while ago that uh, marathas do face a challenge an internal challenge of coping up with their old status so uh, i believe the demand is 
you know kind of kind of justified but it doesn't really fall through the constitution then we answer if you can bring it if you yeah. can bring it manse here we were just discussing uh, earlier in the day now when you talk about reservation where are the jobs as she says it's mostly for education but i don't know how educational institutions are doing there and what's the demand like and what's the supply side there so when you say it's mostly for education see in terms of government jobs we have about 2 and 1/2 lakh vacancies uh, but sometime down the line in 2015 if i'm not wrong the government had taken a call to uh, freeze recruitment because uh, it was taking a fiscal burden in 2018 that policy was changed and uh, it was decided to start recruitments to fill at least 10% of vacancies in every department to begin with uh, the latest round of recruitments that was announced in phases uh, was last year i think when the government decided to uh, open up about 75000 jobs across departments even if you take it's 12 and 13% but even if you take say 10% uh, quota for the marathas it's only 7500 jobs across uh, over several years so jobs is not really uh, you know the carrot uh, here uh, which a, a lot of leaders from the maratha community also admit that it is more about the education it is more about the future of the maratha youth Uh, and more about higher education and uh, it is actually ironic because a number of uh, uh, the the politicians maratha politicians who have dominated maharashtra politics also have education institutions of their own uh, operated under charities as well i was i was looking at some figure the estimated uh, number of undergraduates among the marathas i'm told is just about 8% 8.1% or something uh, when you talk about uh, education yes marathas uh lag in terms of their uh, education or uh, in their in terms of uh, competing with the other caste but uh, largely speaking uh, it's uh, something to do with how the community has uh, evolved over a period of time uh, let's say if you had agrarian interests and most of the opportunities were there in agriculture which were not really urban or away from the urban Uh, people have chosen to remain in the rural because as long as the rural benefited them ritually socially politically economically they were happy over a period of time there is a relative deprivation that any community will face and that relative deprivation comes from where have the dalits landed up in maharashtra today what are the tribals doing in maharashtra today why is it that obcs compete with the open uh, quota in terms of their marks all this leads to relative deprivation among the community who was politically superior or socially superior and to bring in some perspective uh, of you know how the leaders of the maratha community think that yes <clears throat> while this has been a dominant community in maharashtra there is a lot of disparity within that community so yes it's, it's been primarily agrarian but you can still loosely divide it into four classes the topmost is uh the political uh, leaders from the maratha community the members who control the educational institutions and sugar factories the second rung is probably the rich farmers uh from you know uh, predominantly western uh, maharashtra marathwada the second is the, the third is the medium sized farmers and the fourth are the landless laborers uh the fourth uh, the third and the fourth community are uh, are the ones who are actually Uh, who make up most of the uh, pie of the maratha community and they are the ones who are lagging behind and it is for them that the community requires reservations is is an argument that is put forth by the maratha community leaders now within this uh, 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 what uh, the current debate is about uh, uh, manoj jarange patel who is on uh, hunger strike indefinite hunger strike his demand is that all uh, marathas should be considered as kunvis and given reservations the kunbis is uh, an obc sub caste and kunbis get reservations under the other backward classes quota and uh, from my interactions with some leaders from the maratha community uh, and from uh, uh, so basically the idea is that uh, marathas a number of marathas were originally kunbis uh, if you go back generations you will find uh, you know uh, maratha community members having their janma patrika say that they are from the shudra uh, uh, class and not kshatriyas the moreover the kunbis and the marathas uh, i'm relying on a paper your uh, paper published by rajeshwari deshpande and suhas parshikar uh, uh, who are academicians from pune uh, 
so the way they talk about the kundi and the maratha community uh, is that they are both very interrelated they are uh, 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 they are both agrarian primarily both are centered around the western maharashtra maratwada regions and uh, uh, they have also intermarried so what we saw today in all the all party meeting where everybody said yes we are committed to the maratha quota uh, and uh, the government should spend time in coming in in full proofing its case uh, for to prove the social and economic backwardness of the maratha community without touching any other communities quota so where does this all end now i would say that the whole idea this is this is a very uh, 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 politically thought after or sought after move uh, to demand maratha reservations as obcs because that is the only way that i see this demand if we if it sees the day it will only happen if they are able to prove that they are backward socially and educationally as mandal has proved it as mandal recommendations go so that is the only precedent that they have that the mandal has set the the course where mm-hmm. there is social and yeah. educational backwardness <laughs> and you can show that we are socially and educationally backward and that's how uh, we deserve an obc other backward classes status and that's how they become part of us but as mansi a while ago also pointed out i missed on that point that if you become part of the obcs uh, aren't you you know going to eat up the part or the pie of the obcs that is 19% somewhere uh, for the uh, you know obcs so you are going to eat up that reservation uh, and that will be a political landmine uh, yeah absolutely so, absolutely <clears throat> no party will really know how to navigate through it Uh, yeah. no party will know but then here the situation is more tricky because the votes of the marathas are now divided into more than four parties particularly mm. if you want to believe let's say shivasena bjp and uh, ncp and congress uh, at the same time the obc votes are also divided uh, but uh, over a period of time you have realized that obcs though live in pockets across the state have been able to control or have been able to uh influence or impact elections in a in a large manner uh where if one has to really strategize uh, a party like bjp which has banked and grown big on the obc vote base would not like to uh you know lose that share because that is a block that you get uh, eventually over a period of time and uh, if marathas cling on to an, an identity with a hope that shivasena bjp or congress or ncp someone will take their case uh, it's again a divided house so i believe uh, this is going to be a stalemate and it's going to be a very long stalemate because it helps to maintain the status quo which the political parties in maharashtra want now coming to a more violent side of the movement and things being instable uh, i believe that if the state in any country even if it's a democracy decides to throttle and pull down agitations it very well can do it so this is the way in order to prove it to the people that okay we are on your side uh, and we are for your demand but this is certainly not going to happen that you eat up into the obc share so we give you promises and eventually try to uh, you know kill the movement and that's what happened in the past and i believe and i see it likely to happen that uh it is again going to fizzle out with a lot of promises with a lot of legal promises again i, I think am I, am i wrong in thinking that the more it prolongs the better it seems like not sunday uh to a very large extent uh, uh yes because uh, uh i believe there is a large section of marathas which would hope that the ekna chinde led government which is backed by the bjp paring i'm not bringing in the fadnavis angle here i'm hmm. deliberately trying to think aloud that i'm talking in the context of fadnavis's uh, yeah. political future i'll 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 rather come to that context this is another side of it but just i wanted to think aloud on the fact that if at all the state in india uh, dominated by the center the union has to take a call on whether people are obcs or not the ball is in the bjp court as you see the politics of this country going along i don't see the bjp coming to a minority very soon in the national level at the national status so what i see is there is some amount of hope to cling on to eknachinde and to cling on to believe in mm. bjp and to get things done 
I mean, the fact that he wants to make the quota foolproof and uh, able to withhold, uh, withstand the test of any court was something that Pandavis repeated time and again. On this entire success that he had built in 2018, uh, the Maratha community voted in favor of the BJP in large numbers in the Lok Sabha elections as well as in the Assembly election. Now, even though you are saying that their best hope is to cling on to the BJP uh, government with the hope that they can kind of uh, uh, work with the center to get things done. Do you think we'll see different voting patterns uh, this time uh, when, you know, when we have Lok Sabha election? I mean, that anger against Fadnavis is still there that you promised us this. Uh, we believed in you, we gave you a chance and you were not able to deliver it. Uh, plus this whole stigma of... Uh, the Lati charge uh, in the first phase of the protests in September and uh, even what happened over the last two, three days as the agitation got violent. Uh, uh, on the first day, Devendra Fandavis was in Chhattisgarh campaigning for the BJP, which gave the opposition a chance to question whether he really wants to solve things at home. And uh, the next day when he came back, he said that, you know, we'll use attempt to murder charge because these are miscreants. These are not people from the Maratha community. All this has also left a very sour taste in uh, uh, among the community as well. So, I mean, uh, A, Padnavis being in the shadows, Eknath Shinde at the forefront handling the situation. Uh, the fact that this particular, I mean, the previous BJP government could not fulfill uh, it's word of, uh, you know, giving them a reservation that can stand the, uh, that withstand any court's test. How will all of this play out in the Lok Sabha election? Um, it's really tricky for anyone to, I mean, guess what may happen. Uh, but uh, I have a few things running in my mind. Uh, if, if a community has, you know, seen some level of hope, in the past that there was a legal measure that was taken uh, there was an act which was passed there was a commission which was uh, deployed and there was a report that also came up it's the only thing that the court has not really been acceptable to this demand but again if you look at uh, the examples or the parallel examples that have uh, let's say for that matter tamil nadu which was the first one to flout the rule of 50 percent quota or cap on reservations. Uh, it is the amendment in the ninth schedule that happened through a parliamentary intervention that has led to Tamil Nadu and many other states cross the 50 mark, 50% 50 mark or the 50% cap. So again, if you are a thinking voter, I, I, I have always believed that the voters are smart uh, people. In Maharashtra, they have voted very smartly and they will make a move or choice towards the BJP this time also. Also considering to the fact that whether the Congress and NCP have really made themselves very clear or are they loudly thinking about the Maratha reservations, I have seen some kind of inconsistencies within the Congress and the NCP fold also. I have seen a quieter yeah. Rajit Dada Pawar. I have seen a senior Sharad Pawar who is constantly talking and supporting reservations and constantly consoling his OBCs, uh, OBC leaders in his party that he is with them, he won't end their reservation. See, all of this and even for that matter, the Congress uh, in terms of Vijay Vadetivar or uh, Nana Patole have been very sympathetic to the demand. Yet again, they have reasserted or uh, reiterated that OBC reservations won't be touched. And that's exactly what Zarange Patil is going on to do. Uh, if you think about the larger picture, I don't see... Uh, the Congress NCP doing much in this entire debate. Uh, possibly there may be key drivers among the Congress and NCP behind engineering this movement and uh, leading this movement. But, uh, you know, if, if you are a rational voter, the rational choice is now only left uh, is to choose BJP. Eknath Shinde government could come and go. It could be some other chief minister uh, down the line. Uh, but then it's... Uh, more rational or in their self-interest to vote for BJP. That's what... Uh, look, let's uh, look at the internal dynamics in the ruling coalition there. So when they split the Shiv Sena, the BJP's original idea was to weaken the Shiv Sena. And the hope that, you know, over a period of time, Ekna Sindhi will can be sorted out and Fadnavis may be back or BJP may get its chief minister back maybe by 2024 election. But now dynamics have changed. 
Now, Eknath Sindhya has become too big. You cannot afford to replace him even a year later. Give if if the, this agitation continues, if this this grouse remains uh, among the Marathas. So internally, everything is changing for the ruling coalition now. Uh, yes, and there seems to be considerable anger towards Ajit Pawar. I mean, for Ajit Pawar to cancel a visit to Baramati, uh, I mean, his undeniable turf. Uh, because of the fear of protesters. So there's also undeniable anger towards Ajit Pawar. So it's not like you can replace one Maratha face with another within yeah, the... So, so uh, Eknath Sindhi is in a much, much strong, stronger position today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, though the internal dynamics uh, today point out that uh, uh, Eknath Sindhi is in a much uh, stronger position, um, I'd like to believe that it's only uh, time which will possibly, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of uh, test this because uh, the plot of the Shiv Sena that is with uh, the current chief minister is also a floating law. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. as long as people are there committing uh, to a very anti-UBT kind of Shiv Sena, it would be there. But eventually, if the flock that has gone on to join the BJP to form a, form a government, uh, doesn't really fall through or come through, then, I mean, this whole idea of uh, Chief Minister Shinde being a very strong uh, player would be, uh, you know... No, no, I'm talking about the internal dynamic in the ruling coalition, say Fadnavis versus Shinde. I mean, their prospects in future. So, uh, yes, if I talk about the internal dynamics, yes, today what I see uh, is, uh, is that uh, the Chief Minister has scored over uh, the deputy chief minister, but uh, uh, the deputy chief minister has a history, and he being a Brahmin again uh, is is a is a point that we have to consider. Uh, but again, uh, uh, the point is that whether you have a very strong and a you know person who could uh, replace the dynamism of uh, uh, the BJP leadership, I fail to see one uh, in the ruling coalition. I, I mean the coalition that has come from the ships. Right. And what, what is uh, Ajit Pawar really up to? I mean, I know that he is, uh, he, the stated reason is that he is recuperating from dengue, uh, but not made a single statement. The Ajit Pawar-led faction has also not made any strong statement, although in today's uh, protest, there were MLAs and MLCs from the Ajit Pawar faction also involved, uh, saying that the government should do more. But why is Ajit Pawar so silent? Uh, I mean, it's uh, also a silence where uh, he's looking at things or possibly observing what is happening in, in these camps. It is very volatile. And to enter into uh, such a volatile period and going to Zarange Patil and uh, moving this politics is not really going to help the status quo. You have to remember that NCP was a party or has been a party that has like power and that has always been in power since its inception. So they are the people of the government. These are not people who are on the streets always. Uh, like Unlike other parties who, have, who are on the streets and they have come to the government. Uh, that's the fundamental difference between uh, that uh, you, you know, NCP and other parties. You also have to understand that NCP is undergoing an internal uh, politics of themselves. So the current attention is to gain as many people from uh, the senior power faction, that is also a case. And also to watch out and just watch over the politics of how the chief minister and the deputy chief minister are handling this. And hmm. possibly spring up into action when things uh, are in control or things go out of control or things go berserk, where uh, the deputy chief minister, who is a Brahmin, may not be a very acceptable person, where the CM has failed to deliver and the only choice that emerges in front of people is the Ajit Dada Power NC. So it's a wait and watch strategy, nothing else. Uh, but and the other opposition, probably the other opposition parties may also be looking at, you know, okay, let let these parties cook their own goose. Those who are in power, we'll yeah. see later how the situation develops. Right. I think that's what everybody is in the wait and watch mode for now. But but I, as I as I've always pointed out that uh, 
if you don't see much of a strong commitment from ajit dada's faction you also need to see how the congress has uh, reacted and not yet reacted on despite having a maratha faction uh, to it uh, today's congress after uh, the ncp ajit dada pawar and sharad earlier on sharad pawar's exit you see a congress which is now come to be dominated again by certain obc factions or certain obc leaders and therefore there has you know one could expect a very strong statement from the congress but it's not coming they're always very sympathetic yet very cautious in their comment uh, so this is an interesting uh, you know point where we wait to see what happens it's also the fact that uh, people are not uh, you know maratha leaders who are uh, so dominant are not really liking the fact that some obscure person from jalna who a district which has never dominated or never seen in maharashtra politics is kind of calling shots it is also a strategy to derail the movement eventually and kind of pull back the sources or pull back uh, you know uh, the in your head. so for once these opposition parties must be happy being where they are in the opposition <laughs> possibly <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we'll end on that note. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, the very highly enriching discussion, giving us a glimpse into uh, you know how Marathas historically have been and uh, the politics of today. Uh, it the next few months will definitely be interesting to watch in the run up to the Lok Sabha election. And thank you uh, to our viewers uh, for watching Political Alert. We will be back again with a new episode.